All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome again to our weekly Ship Show series. I'm your host, Jason Brand. I'm the Director of Business Development at Supply Chain Solutions. And this show would not be possible without the consistent behind-the-scenes efforts of our very own Vanessa Fry, and who is the Director of Marketing, and she does many other things, which we all know about. So thank you so much, Vanessa. This week, we also have a special guest for you, who's an associate of mine, the wonderful Cindy Jo Minette. Cindy brings a lot of experience through working with some of our larger and more complex customers. And as a new internal goal for this series, we want to kind of hand the microphone to a wider spectrum of associates inside our company. And we want to let them to start to unpack some of the things they're seeing and what they're dealing with on a daily basis. So Cindy's really brought an awesome amount of content this week. And our goal with you all today is to discuss five key things everyone here needs to be doing to ensure your supply chain is optimized. Now, I'll touch on our first topic, but after that, I want CJ to kind of run through the rest. And so, uh, but before we dive in, if you didn't see the show last week, it makes the perfect precursor to what we're talking about today. I suggest everyone who hasn't seen it, reach out to me, reach out to us, um, or you can just give me a quick call. It's, it's uh, to give you a quick brief overview of what we talked about. So we've strategically partnered with a company called Sourcing Insights, and they're able to hook up to a wide range of ERP systems. And, you know, their own words, actually, they said, we haven't found an ERP system we can't hook up to yet, which is interesting. Trust me, we've seen some crazy ones here. But um, they essentially break down everything into a total cost analysis. From there, we can actually take that data and make sure our supply chain suggestions have real total landed cost benefits. It's extremely powerful stuff. We built this strategic alliance uh, for a, a great reason. We've had some great success with it so far. So give me a call. You can give CJ a call. You can give Vanessa a call or shoot us an email. We'll set you up with these guys and you can learn a little bit more firsthand from them. It is definitely worth at least 30 minutes of your time. And uh, I know they can also hook you or anyone else up generally within 30 minutes, unless you have some really crazy system, it could take 45. <laughs> That's their own words as well. So before we get going, we've made it a little bit of a custom here. Let's uh, take a moment to appreciate the struggles that the people of Ukraine have endured over the past year. Thank you all. All right, CJ. Well, I'm excited to have you on the show here. So I know we talked about the topic quite a few times. And I just wanted, you know, we had a little thesis that you told me about. So I kind of want you to start everybody off by just talking about your thesis. Sure. Um, so no matter how efficient your supply chain is running, finding ways to improve your supply chain is something you should always be doing. However, knowing how to improve and optimize your supply chain can be a real challenge. That's perfect. Yeah. And I think that does kind of sum up the goal of our show today. So I'm going to take this first wheel or this first idea of optimization, and then I'm going to shut up. I'm going to let CJ take the rest, but let's, let's move the slide on to step one. All right. So step one, we talk about this all the time, but it is technology. So what does it mean when we say in order to have an optimized supply chain, you need to have technology. So I think it would make sense to make it more specific, and I think it would make it a little bit more digestible. So really what that means is you need to have visibility through technology. You need to have automation through technology, and you need to have accountability through technology. Mm -hmm. So what we see and what we have seen a lot over the past 20 years, and I'd say actually in the past five years, we've really seen a huge uptick in this, but we're seeing a lot of companies going through ERP overhauls. And this does, or at least it can achieve a lot of those goals I just mentioned. Now, if there's any of you out there who have gone through an SAP implementation or a Microsoft Dynamics implementation, I'm sure you already know the feeling of buyer's remorse. And especially if you are on the deciding end of some of those changes. And I'm also sure that through that process, you've got more than a few core memories of those team meetings and of frustrated colleagues and associates. It's, and uh, yeah, and some probably sleepless, sleepless nights. So um, yeah, I feel bad for you. So I'm sorry, but obviously they are all great tools. I want to be really clear. We are not an ERP. We do not have a, you know, 
plug and play version of an ERP. But what we offer is really the opportunity to get those benefits of an upgraded ERP system without the upfront costs, without most of the implementation costs, and without a lot of those internal struggles. So one of the things is it, it allows us to have visibility on where you are in the market today. And, it, and this is what we offer. And it also allows you and your teams to have access to information about your shipping, your financials, your documents, your trends, your carriers, and a whole lot more. And ERP can do that, but also we are able to do that as well. So as an example, take for instance, what I consider the most basic level of visibility. And that's understanding how much stock you have at a specific location. Now, wouldn't it be nice to have that information available to you within minutes on any specific SKU for any meeting you'd like and accessible to anyone you choose in the company? So that level of real-time inventory tracking, it exists and it's part of the tools that we offer. And on top of that, visibility isn't only a point and shoot thing. It's also important that you and your teams are being made aware of trends while they're happening. So for example, let's say the lead times for your incoming containers has been slowly creeping downward. And as a result, stock levels may be slowly rising. Well, one of the many benefits of a plugged in visibility tool is allowing you to be notified of this trend to make, and actually to take that a step further, consider this idea of automation I talked about. So it'd also be nice to have actionable mins and maximums for each of your SKUs that would notify your shipping teams or notify an outside shipping organization saying, hey, if we don't ship this product within this week, based on trend data, you're going to stock out. And that isn't fiction. That actually is happening today. We have this built for customers today. And it's just part of the power of some of the tools that are offered out there right now. Now, I also think you have to take kind of a, a more wholesome view of this. And I've seen this, I know others have seen this, but one of the strongest powers of companies using these supply chain operation tools today is it really helps break down the walls between departments. And it's kind of adding this new structural base to decision-making across the company. So I know that's like a soft benefit and it's kind of funny because I've been in so many meetings where you know we're talking about, we're doing a presentation, we're talking about soft savings and hard savings and someone's like, well, I can't pay my, pay my mortgage with soft savings. And it's like, it's so funny because it's so true. I mean, it's, it's a hilarious point, but we also see so many companies and you'd be surprised how many companies that their biggest barrier to having a successful, you know, shipping environment or being a successful shipper is those barriers between departments and having a new structural base of information that everyone can log on, see the same thing educate each of your teams on what's going on and, and what the facts are of your shipping and your organization and, and what the lines are, that is so powerful. And it, it also helps prevent that whole throwing the ball over the wall to the next department, a potato game. So it is really, truly amazing how much we're able to connect nowadays. And like, you have to remember what we just were talking about was really what I view as the simplest level of visibility. But imagine getting real-time updates from the port when your container is making it through checkpoints or when it's being loaded or having built-in estimated times of arrival plug right into your forecasts. So, you know, yes, this isn't here yet, but this automatically updating estimated time of arrival based on weather, based on events, based on port operations, based on the carrier is feeding into everything. It's incredibly powerful. Now, I would love to talk about this all day. There's so many interesting just situations where you can talk about, hey, how would technology help me here? A visibility tool, automation, or adding accountability. But I also think we've kind of talked about enough where you can start to think about your own operations and some of the bottlenecks and the process flows. And it's also a really great segue into our next step of supply chain optimization. So Vanessa, why don't you move the slide? CJ, why don't you talk to him a little bit about supplier relationships? Thanks, Jason. So that was really the perfect transition to step two. Optimization um, as technology aspect is one of the key factors when building a relationship with suppliers. And I think you all will notice as we continue through the program, a lot of these things, suggestions you'll find under multiple steps, and they all tend to 
build on each other. So supplier relationships are critical to the health of your business, delivery, service, and quality are all dependent on suppliers. So strong vendor relationships make daily work more productive. They can facilitate a better deal, thereby increasing profit and aids in achieving long-term strategies. So to start with, just like Jason was mentioning, invest in technology. So with your vendors, technology can improve process controls, eliminate tiresome paperwork, increase employee productivity, there's cost savings, you're reducing process cycle time, and those are just some of the benefits. Additionally, just like Jason also mentioned, is the transparency, and that creates a trust between your business and the supplier, and that's really important, um, which is another, it just flows right into the constant communication that should take place between your organization and your suppliers. So you need to find a way to create channels for communication, to engage in two-way communication. You don't want to be the kind of business that communicates with suppliers only when things go wrong or when you're making demands. So you need to tackle issues in a timely and professional manner. You want to treat your suppliers as a vital part of your business, and they are for the exact reasons that I've just said. So you want to notify your suppliers of new products, changes in personnel, any special offers or promotions, and when you have a change in your strategy. You want to listen to your suppliers, address their concerns. You want to be able to understand your supplier's business, just as you want them to be able to understand yours. Um, be aware, be familiar with their investors, their mission, their objectives, and how they operate. And, you know, in doing so, in understanding your suppliers, this is, allows you to align your company with theirs and for to grow together. Um, along those lines, especially with everything being so global, make sure that you're aware and that you respect cultural differences. Um, this goes a long way. Uh, people are you know, thankful, appreciative when you've gone out of your way to understand their culture. Um, business is, you know, global, like we spoke about, and I'm sure that most of you likely work with people of different cultures, different regions, and different religions. Um, research your supplier's culture, and if you're unable to find a lot of information about that, just go ahead and have a, ca a casual conversation. People usually are thankful that you want to learn more about them. So um, that's just another way to build good rapport. So this brings us to step three. Vanessa, if you would move to step three, please. And CJ, by the way, I, I totally agree with you. Uh, honestly, having that a great relationship with suppliers, it's so critical, especially if you're looking at the past couple of years where expenses were going through the roof all over the place, right? I mean, we right. can go back to, you know, 2016, a little bit earlier, actually, um, going to have to get my year correct. But as we started to implement the 232s and then to the 301 tariffs, you know, these costs for obviously buyers was going up substantially, at least domestic buyers. And having a good relationship with your supplier and having at least a line of communication at least led to better strategies and also helped, you know, your cost creep not to be as extreme. I and mean, we've seen a couple companies that had a lot of cost creep just because the supplier relationship was at a minimal level. Just what you said, you know, only talking to suppliers when you need to make a change just right. does not equal the best product and also the best price. So, you know, Jason, you're right on. And that really does take us to step three. Um, so consult with supply chain experts. That could be internal. It could be external. And as far as external, that does include your suppliers. Your suppliers and partners can be a great source of information as they may have experienced themselves. 
similar struggles or had partners who did so, and they can explain how they mitigated the situation. Now, everything may not be applicable to your situation, but it could certainly help move things forward. Also, um, you know, you can utilize the services of your suppliers. So you want to learn from your supplier all the services that are available. And also take a look at your contract agreement. You may find that there are um, services that they offer that you're not utilizing or not taking full advantage of. So that's another reason uh, to keep that communication open, like you were talking about, Jason. And also, if your organization lacks a dedicated logistics team, then you can also look at a consultant um, and they can provide the expertise that you need to manage your supply chain. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, looking internally, um, you know, who knows your business better than the associates that keep it running from the ground up? So you want to promote collaboration and training among your associates. So not only with management, but between each other. Um, you know, they're on the floor. They're experiencing things real time. They can help each other to come up with suggestions that still fit within the protocol that's been outlined in the organization. Um, you want to communicate with associates about inefficiencies and suggestions that improve such. So you want to make sure that associates feel comfortable being able to speak up and identify what's not going as planned and that they know that by doing so, the reward will be able, you know, it'll be being able to fix that and have things move smoothly going forward as opposed to bringing about a problem and somebody being punished or called out for that. Um, also important is to create production plans that are feasible to execute and that are based on actual plant conditions. You know, we all want to, you know, sell as much, um, do the best that we can, but sometimes you really have to look, take a hard look at what is our system and our people set up to be capable for um, mm -hmm. and, and operate within those constraints. Also, um, you know, as I spoke about before, your supply chain is only as efficient as the people who manage it. So you have your warehouse associates, your order fillers, your logistics managers, all should be trained on standard operating procedures. That way they're providing consistent and efficient and accuracy when they're making decisions. So, you know, speaking of your supply chain and only being as efficient as the people running it, that brings us to being able to eliminate waste, which is step four. So first, I would suggest creating a list of all the moving parts of your inbound and your outbound logistics, highlighting those in particular that you know are high cost areas. Then you can prioritize those items and any others where performance seems to be below expectations. So that's kind of your low hanging fruit, if you will. Additionally, I'd like to look at a few aspects um, that allow you to analyze defects. So defects can be things such as quality management. So do you have a quality management policy? Are you able to identify when items aren't of quality and what to do about it? Are you checking with raw material suppliers? Are you checking with your outsourcing agents, ensuring that quality is being maintained? So if there is an issue on the floor with defects and you've looked internally to make sure your processes are not the cause of it, then are you reaching out to your suppliers and checking on you know, the raw material the quality, have they changed uh, suppliers? So speaking of managing your manufacturing process, 
You need to identify the process that your team is following. So there may be a process that's set up in the system and they may be following that as well as they can, but based on you know, certain factors, environmental factors, they've had to make some changes or aren't able to follow that um, in the way that it was designed. So it's important to find out exactly what process the team is following. And then take a look at that and find an alternative that can decrease the production feedbacks and that's feasible for everyone to follow. Hey, CJ, you mind if I say, yes. say something real quick? So a lot of these processes have been set up in organizations, but they just haven't been taken a look at in a long time. Yes. And as companies grow, those old processes become constraints. We, um, you know, we were founded by, technically it was a consulting opportunity that brought together a few logistics experts. And we, we found ourselves de developing technology literally within our first two years of being founded. <laughs> it actually got used for 14 years. We were, we were bringing yeah. on it. It was, it was hilarious. A really, really fun story. But we, we've found it a point that when we go into certain organizations that we do a process map of wherever we're going to be investigating, because you'd be surprised just how much low hanging fruit is right there. So I just wanted to say, excellent point. Just continue on. Sorry, CJ. Thanks, Jason. Um, and as long as we are uh, just taking a break, if we could move to step four, that would be great while we're talking about eliminating waste. So another form of waste is overprocessing. So as you know, that's adding more value to a product than the customer requires. Now you might think like, well, gosh, how could you ever add too much value? And I'm not saying that you should shortchange the value, but in areas, for example, um, where the maybe there's an area that will never be seen on your widget, well, then there's no need to paint that area. So that would be a form of overprocessing. So you're still delivering a quality product. You're just not, you know, using the extra time and resources to paint someone something that will never be seen. So the results of that, the waste that overprocessing causes, obviously it costs you money with regards to the time of your staff, the materials used the wear and tear on your equipment. And although these costs may seem small, they can amount to a considerable sum over time. They'll also reduce your effectiveness as the operators that are over, pro oh, excuse me, over processing could be performing other value add tasks that the company is actually, that your customer is actually willing to pay you for. Um, similar to over processing, uh, and equally as important is to consider overproduction. So overproduction also equals waste. Overproduction has the potential to cause wasted materials, wasted final products. And to take it one step further, this means a waste of money and resources. That includes associated time. Um, it requires the area where you're required to store that overproduction, um, you have to maintain it, or you're getting rid of it as unused inventory. So not only are you losing, you know, profit on the materials, but also on the time spent, your associate's time, and your storage space. So, you know, that's where forecasting comes in and is so important. And there's several methods of forecasting, and there's really not one method that's correct for everyone. Um, however, as Jason talked about earlier, something that's important to help with forecasting is the implementation of technology. And the reason for that is, just like Jason said, you're providing more visibility, you have the ability to access real-time inventory tracking so you can avoid stockouts, back orders, and overpaying carrying costs. Mm -hmm. Also, yeah. by implementing um, an IMS, you're also given access to the data and analytics to help you make informed business decisions so that you're able to have accurate forecasting. 
So when we're eliminating waste from work in progress, this emphasizes the importance of reforecasting, whether that's quarterly, semi-annual, or another measure of time based on the cyclical demand for your product. Um, and along with that is your work in progress. So work in progress is just overproduction, whether it's necessary or unnecessary. If it's a universal part to multiple products, then working ahead and producing enough to fill each product's order is efficient. However, if the part being made um, does not fill immediate demands or needs even a minor adjustment based on which product it's being produced for, then waste is created. It's retire, it's excuse me, it's requiring two times the movement as you're having to, you know, set it to the side, going to get other parts to make those minor adjustments, bringing it back, putting those two together. So you're, you, you have the waste of movement, production, and associate time. On the other end of the scale, though, is waiting. And this is also a problem because a waste of waiting is idle time. You know, idle time spent by people or machines when the materials or information aren't immediately available to proceed. So again, going back to forecasting, the visibility that software or that uh, technology, excuse me, that technology affords you. Um, so this not only by itself creates waste, but waiting can cause, you know, other multiple forms of waste. So I'd also like to talk about the importance of communication with internal and external experts, uh, vendor relationships, and how they can aid with reducing waste uh, when you're moving your freight so that you can do that faster and more efficiently. So, you know, you want to gauge on time performance. You want to analyze your procurement process for more effective buying strategies and overcome any supply chain challenge. Vendor consolidation is another benefit. Learning how to strategically load um, or load planning to optimize inbound freight and reduce your procurement costs. Um, with transportation, make sure you're utilizing the best modes of transport for each load and find ways to reduce costs without compromising your service. So, you know, we've gone through the four steps and the fifth step is equally as vital and that's just repeat. So once you've optimized your supply chain, you want to make sure that you're doing this on a regular basis. You need to remain efficient, um, analyze metrics, are they, and that metrics you're using, are they relevant to current strategies? So the metrics that you used five years ago, last year, even six months ago, are they relevant to your current strategies? Everything is changing and moving so fastly right now that it's really important to take the time and step back to make sure you're aligned with your strategies, um, to make sure your outcomes are meeting the expectations. Jason, do you have any thoughts on that? Oh yeah, oh yeah. This is uh, you gotta it, you gotta rinse, wash, repeat, and this is kind of what we <laughs> well do said. Our organization. I mean, honestly, we set up a, a basically a process where we review our performance with our clients every. It, it depends on the customer, but it can be you know sometimes monthly, but generally speaking, we do it either three months or half year or at least once a year. And we review kind of what our goals were, where we landed and what we learned. And then we kind of design that next period, what our goals will be, you know, where we'd like to land and, you know, what changes we're going to make. And so, you know, when you think about each of these areas, like particularly in eliminating waste, some of those things, you know, you hear them and you're like, yeah, that's, that's, of course I want to do that. But, you know, CJ's worked with a couple customers that are huge. I mean, I, I, we have to get their permission before discussing them, but there's a customer in particular where they manufacture a very large item and it's able to be basically broken down into almost an infinite possible number of modifications for specific customers. And that overproduction concept there is 
crucial to their success. And it's actually crucial to why they're so competitive. But it's also a concept that can be distilled to other companies. And, you know, it's, it, and I love the way you talked about it. You're like, oh, that sounds weird. Like, you don't want me to do, make the best possible product. Well, that's not what she's saying. She's just saying, you know, put money, time, and effort into areas that are valuable given its use. And it's, it's just, yeah. So obviously we think that, uh, you know, upgrading your technology, making sure it's in line with the marketplace is a critical step one. If you want to have a good idea of maybe the potential benefits you could be seeing from any of these changes, talk to our strategic partners, Sourcing Insights, because they will break it down for you very <laughs> right. grimly in a spooky level of detail. Yeah. And it will make you feel like, oh my gosh, I need five years to, to fix all this. But no, they make it very, very approachable. And, you know, uh, and Jason, some of these some of these um, ways to add efficiency to your supply chain, they sound so basic, yeah, you know, yeah. and I understand that. But really, it's just important that you take that first step. Mm -hmm. I know it's scary. I know it's hard to know where to start. So just take that first step. Start with the basics yep. and see what you uncover. Um, and then, like you said, bring in the experts to help you, mm -hmm. to help you go from there develop KPIs on some of these basic things yes. as well. What do you want? What are you tracking? And, the, and it, if you're not tracking it, you're not, you don't know what's going on. And so mm -hmm. you can't improve what you don't track. I'm, there's a quote. I really want to get it right, but I just messed it up twice. But anyway, um, yeah, CJ, any final, final thoughts for the group right now? Well, you know, I'd love to hear if anyone has questions. Um, so Vanessa, do we have any questions? We have one question over here. And if you have any others, you can send my way or you can email Jason and CJ as well. The question is, if there is one step to prioritize, which one would you suggest? Mm -hmm. I, I'd actually, do you mind if I start with this one? CJ? No, go ahead, Jason. Yeah. I would actually start with bringing in, well, okay. If there's an Bring in a consultant to do a process map in a specific area first. That is a great, uh, it, what we see oftentimes is companies grow and then they want to be with the market, but they don't know which direction to go. And so generally speaking, starting with a small consulting project, just to analyze what, where I'm at right now can help you really, at least can help you in, in your decision-making for where should I put money for improvement and what would be the most bang for my buck. I'd say that's number one. I think. Um, CJ, do you want to go for? Yes. So in addition to the technology, I would say that developing a relationship with your suppliers would be a good step as well, because in order to fulfill the strategies or the ideas or get the information that the consultant needs to help you, most likely you're going to need to reach out to your suppliers. And if you already have that strong relationship, um, it's going to be much easier to obtain the information, to get ideas, to get you know what's going correctly. Um, where are we having challenges? What's going wrong that we really need to address? So if you're able to gather that information easily and quickly, um, that's a great benefit. Also, with a lot of the strategies of uh, using technology, that technology is going to be used by your suppliers as well. So having them on board is going to make it a lot easier and make things run more efficient. It's a critical point having them on board because you know a, a lot of the technology out there today allows two-way communication allows mm -hmm. APIs so the two-way transfer of data back right. and forth and if you don't have suppliers that are willing to play ball then or you don't have the relationship with your suppliers then you know it can it can hinder some of your technology implementations so um you know having that relationship is important and I want to say one more thing on suppliers scorecarding having a scorecarding process that is reliable and is valuable um, oh, is actually, a point. Great, yeah, it's just a great, it's, you, everyone kind of gets scared because they're like, oh, we got to like ding our suppliers, but it also helps that, that relationship like have goals. Yeah. And so if you have goals in that relationship with your supplier, you can at least, they know what you view as success. And, you know, as a result, right. they can work towards that. So, and do the scorecarding both ways. Yeah, because exactly. the more efficient everyone is, the more everyone wins. It's true. It's true. Because you also want your, 
you would like your company to be able to be desirable for suppliers as well, because, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, great example, the chip shortage. I mean, everyone right. wanted chips, but there's only a few companies that got it. And there's a few more right. reasons than, you know, but anyway, Hey, thank you everybody for joining today. We, a lot of, a lot of stuff to talk about and probably we're going to zoom in on a few of these and just blow it up for you guys. So you can learn a little bit more how you can implement some of these quickly and easily in later shows. So stay tuned. Thanks so much. And CJ, you're wonderful. Thank you much, so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.